All right, hey everybody, um, welcome to yet another Project Lemonade here with uh, Digital Transitions. Uh, I'm Spencer Zitterich. I am a CH system specialist here at DT. Um, I mainly work in R&D and tech support, um, and I am going to be presenting today with David Weibel here um, from Avian Rochester on the DT Next Generation Target V2, as well as the sort of step-by-step -step workflow um, to creating an in-situ color profile in Capture One and using Basic Color Input Pro. So Dave's gonna start us off um, and introduce the target, um, uh, sort of the thought process behind it, how he went about um, creating it, and uh, so yeah, take it away, Dave. Dave? Uh, Very good. Ah, uh, there we go. Okay. All right. Thanks, Spencer. Sorry about that, folks. Um, so we're going to just dive in here and talk a little about just the big picture of what uh, it means to actually characterize your camera. And that's it's all, it's all laid out in this slide. So uh, the idea is we're going to start with that physical target. That's NGT2 you're looking at there. And we are gonna image that or scan that with, with some device. Uh, this is just a, a camera, it could be a flatbed scanner, you know, anything like that. Uh, and, and after we take that image, we've got, now we've got an RGB image, right? So probably everybody knows that, right? We've got this three plane RGB image. Um, and then uh, from, uh, from a measurement point of view, so down in the lower left there, we see a, a spectrophotometer and uh, the other path for the data uh, from the target is going to be C-Lab data. So this is a uh, color space. If you don't not familiar with uh, with C-Lab, um, we'll show you some plots of that a little later. Uh, but it's another it's another three dimensional color space like RGB, but it's more um, relatable to what people see, how human beings see color. So so I take it with my measurement device and I measure all 130 patches there, and get the C-Lab data for that. Now, if we go back to the top right, that RGB image, um, I'll use some software to uh, average uh, the mean RGB values for each of those 130 patches. And so now I've got digital camera data in the lower right, mean RGB patch values. And then I've got measured C-Lab data, which is really what correlates better to how human beings see color. Uh, and I'm going to take those two things and in, in basic color, and this is what um, Spencer's going to talk a lot about in a little bit, I'm going to, I'm going to mathematically relate the C-Lab data to the RGB data, and then out comes uh, an ICC profile. And all that profile is doing is uh, what I just said is a mathematical conversion from RGB values to C-Lab data, and, and in some cases, the reverse of that, if you, if you need that. So that's a big picture of what's going on here. Nothing too scary, really. Um, and then once we've developed that ICC profile, uh, I can use this in a test case uh, for your more routine imaging, right? I, I uh, put a sample up, and I take an image with the same camera that I've characterized, of course. And from that, I get an RGB image, just like we did with the target on the previous slide. Now I process that with that ICC profile that we developed, and then out comes estimated pixel-wise C-Lab data. So now, rather than an RGB image, uh, at every pixel, we've got an estimate of the C-Lab data for our original target. And, and we hope that they would match that original sample, but since, uh, we can't measure anything that small is a problem. That's why we have to use a camera. The instrument you, that I showed on the previous slide uh, might have an aperture of say three millimeters, which is too much when we're looking at a real image or a piece of artwork or any, any sort of artifact. Um, we need this pixel wise C-Lab data. And that's what, this, um, that's what this process lets us do. So let's go a little bit into the target itself. 
Um, so here's the target that you saw before, a little bit larger. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot about this. The first thing I want to just mention is that I put these um, fiducial marks in the corner. Um, some of the software, you won't see it today um, because we're using different software, but there's software out there that relies on these squares in each of the corners uh, to uh, locate the patches. So it has a kind of a, a an idea of what the patches, uh, what the patch distribution should be. It locates these four crosses, and then that sort of mathematically locks in uh, the image, uh, and then uh, the software can average those RGB values that we were talking about a minute ago. So that's an important feature here. And then there's uh, a variety of color features in here, as you might imagine. So I'll start with a blue rectangle in the middle. For, I call that familiar colors. So you may or may not recognize those 24 patches. Um, uh, and But I just call them familiar colors because it keeps the trademark people happy. Um, above that in red is an extended neutral scale. So the bottom row you see of the familiar colors is a neutral scale going from that's the whitest white on the target to the blackest black on the target. Um, this now star about nine if, uh, if you know about L star that that black is very very black which is nice. And then the, um, the neutral scale up above inside of the red is actually uh, is interleaved in between those six down below. So what in the, in the end up you have a uh, um, I think eleven or twelve uh, neutral uh, in, in the neutral scale there. So then uh, in the the green uh, squares we have uh, all the way around the outside. I put in a bunch of extra whites, and that is to uh, potentially do some flat fielding if you want to do sort of. Uh, Poor man's flat fielding, we'll call it, without having to image a white card. You could kind of do that. You could, at very least, you can easily estimate uh, what kind of illumination uh, uniformity you have. You hope that those would all measure the same um, from your camera, the same RGB values. But if they don't, that might be an indication that you have some illumination issues. And the last thing to talk about here is those, uh, what I marked in yellow. And those patches are representing uh, 1,200 heritage colors that um, I and uh, some colleagues at the Library of Congress uh, measured from a variety of artifacts. And I'm gonna talk a little more about them on the next slide. So these were from uh, books, periodicals, manuscripts, photographic prints, really anything I, could, anything I could get my hands on that was interesting to the Library of Congress. This was originally developed for the Library of Congress uh, for their uh, archiving uh, needs. And then what you're looking at in the plot there, uh, this is an LAB plot, but I've left lumen and south. There's no L, so this is an A star, B star plot. So you kind of see uh, positive A stars red on the left side, negative A star green on the left side, positive B star blue on top, or yellow on top, excuse me, negative B star blue on the bottom. So the uh, the small gray dots are the Munsell Book of Color, uh, and then the the uh, the colored spots are all of the 1200 that we measured and from those, so a lot of data there. One thing that was kind of interesting, uh, when we plotted these up by the time period of when the artifact was made, we kind of saw, we could sort of see the, uh, the, the space of colors available to the printers of the time kind of expanded over time. And we ended up choosing uh, the, uh, the area that I indicated in the red oval there. Um, and not a surprise when we look at old documents and manuscripts and things. Remember, this is not an artwork per se uh, application where we're looking at old paints and things. We're really looking at um, printed material, manuscripts, things like that, that the Library of Congress is interested in. And so you can imagine when you start looking at old manuscripts and old books and uh, old printed material, maps and things, um, what do you see? You see a lot of this sort of tan, it's faded paper, that sort of thing. So that's what we emphasized with the, that yellow, um, let me go back here. That's what we emphasized here. So those colors you can kind of imagine are, are in this kind of faded paper world. Um, with a few a little bit more chromatic reds um, that we that we left in there because of the population that you see here. So, so one of the things that uh, we tried really hard to make is a target that is both uniform in color. Uh, each patch is uniform in color, and each patch is also very very flat. Uh, so the target is actually 
um, the base frame for the target is actually a piece of machined aluminum. And then uh, the patches are inserted into little machine cups there. And so on the left, what you see is the sort of ideal case, which I think the, the NGT presents the ideal case, where um, all of the gloss from the light source is reflected away in that long arrow you see going to the left off at the gloss angle. And that leaves nothing but the nice diffuse signal getting up to the camera. That's kind of what you want in this case. Um, because it's replicating the type of measurement that you took. Most all of you out there, if you're going to measure a target or if you're going to buy measurements for a target like this, they're going to be 45-0 measurements. It's a measurement geometry, uh, and, it's, it, and it, optically it means that the light is incident at 45 degrees, as you see. I've sort of uh, estimated that in a schematic, and then the detection is at zero degrees. So uh, you can help make profiles better if you can make sure that your measurement geometry optically aligns with your photographic or your imaging geometry. And that's what I've tried to show here on the left. On the right, now obviously this is an exaggeration. You know, no one's gonna use a target that's bowed like I've drawn there, but just as an exaggeration so we can get an idea what's going on here. Now you see that the gloss from that light source is coming off in many different angles. And if some of that kind of sneaks into the camera, which it will, um, then that's going to potentially mess up your ability to get a really good profile out of that um, when you can't keep the uh, the target at the reference target uh, flat enough. And that is not a problem here because we have this uh, machine aluminum frame. So um, kind of summarizing here, I've said a few of these things, but we'll just go through them one more time. Um, it's a robust metal construction, as I said, machined aluminum and anodized. Uh, the color patches, I didn't highlight this one yet. The color patches here are able to be cleaned. Uh, you can uh, get your reference data from this. If you get a smudge on it, fingerprint, a um, little squirt of alcohol, and you can clean that up. And you don't measure this again. The color does not change when you do this. And, and that's a really unique feature for this uh, particular target. Uh, the targets are all serialized. If you look in the lower right corner, you'll see a serial number. So when you're imaging this target, you know exactly which one you imaged. Uh, that just stays in the permanent record. You don't have to worry about your, uh, your imaging technicians writing anything down even. Well, there are other things to write down. Um, patch IDs, you see the anodizing uh, letters across the top, numbers down the side, the fiducial marks I talked a lot about. Um, these are available with a NIST traceable calibration. calibration. Most of you probably would want the 450 bi-directional, but we have other instrumentation available if you want. Um, there are reasons to do both. Um, we put in, I, I put optional individually measured patches. Um, I'm not sure I, what that one meant. Uh, Spencer might have put that one in there, but we'll see. Uh, and customer support available for both uh, DT and from Avian Rochester. So depending on what your needs are, um, we could customize this target. We could pull out patches and put in your own if you want. Um, we could do anything like that. Um, so that's what I have. I think we're going to take some questions later on toward the end, but um, thanks for your attention. And I'm going to send this back over to Spencer. I think what I, you know, what was meant by that, the optionally individually measured patches, um, that's sort of the same way that a lot of targets are distributed, which we have sort of nominal values from the production run of a, of a batch of targets. Um, you know, on average, we can expect patch D2 to be, you know, one value, patch K5 to be another value. Um, we can offer, um, with the purchase of the target, um, specific hand measured values for your serial number, uh, your serialized target. So that those are already done for you if you, you know, if you don't have something like a spectrophotometer to make those measurements. Um, and as we'll go over, um, you know, having those specific measurements are going to aid in uh, more successful profile creation. Got it. That makes sense. So we do have nominal data is what I would call that. The nominal data is always available, but if you want the specific data, you probably are going to get a better profile out of it. So, okay. Very good. All right. So let's see. I'll start presenting my screen. I'll go ahead and take over this. Okay, so here we are in Capture One. Um, 
one of the things, and I'm just going to turn this camera off. So, um, I'm going to kind of walk through the step by step here of, of how we go ahead and image a target for successful ICC profile creation. Um, you know, the first thing that you're going to want to do is, of course, set up set up the camera height, determine the you know the size of the target within the field of view. Um, very generally speaking, um, I would say like a rule of of one ninth, one over nine. You know, if you had a if you had to separate your your imaging area into a grid of of nine squares, um, that the target itself should take up about a ninth of the camera's field of view, depending on the lens that you're using. Um, yeah, ideally, you're going to be wanting to use the lens that you plan on doing imaging with. Um, so, so make sure you kind of keep that in mind as you're building this profile, um, uh, especially if you have a pretty wide range of and quality of optics. You know, different optics could introduce. You know, of course, poorer optics could introduce something like color cast. So. Um, you know, you want to you want to do this specific to your your camera setup, your lens, your camera, your sensor. Um, so I've done that here. Um, you know, there it's not particularly exactly centered in this example, um, but centered enough is is good. Um, you know, specifically, I'm looking at the NGT version one down here. Um, did not have my hands on for these samples, just you know, logistics and everything. Um, I had my version one files available to me on my computer. So um, you'll see that this looks a bit different than the version two model. Um, the only thing being, these are square, um, these are square patches, the other are circular, everything else about it as far as you know, being on the metal frame um, and, and the actual paints uh, that are used here, the, the, the patches are identical. It's just purely, purely visual. Um, so, you know, you want to have this target roughly, you know, roughly one ninth of the field of view, um, roughly centered. Um, by doing that, you can reduce illuminant non-uniformity across the imaging area, even before you're doing an LCC in Capture One or, or flat fielding, as we'll call it. Um, and let's see, my mouse clicks on here. You'll also see that you know if you have your target centered in the frame, that can help reduce things like geometric metamerism um, across the image so that if you, you, know, if you do have the, the target maybe too close to one side of your imaging platform, you could get uh, slightly different results. The light is not hitting that at, at that 45 degree angle that um, that Dave was talking about. So that sort of leads me to my next point, which is, you know, we want to set up our lights. Once we have our camera uh, sort of set up, uh, the target is in focus, we want to set up those lights um, to you know, cross light your image just like you would um, be lighting, you know, objects for uh, generic reproduction. And you want to have that 45 or so degree angle. As close as you can to that 45 is going to generate the best, um, the best quality results when we go in there and measure the brightness uh, of any of these patches. Um, so, once we once we kind of have that set up, we have our lights set up the way that we want it to. The target is is positioned. We're going to move forward and create a LCC profile or a lens cast calibration profile. Um, okay, this is something in Capture One, very specifically in Capture One, a tool in Capture One that we can use um, to create a flat field um, for our our imaging area. Um, you'll see this is a tool here labeled LCC. And if I disable what this tool is doing, we'll see that it's, it's basically going to correct for any sort of light fall off um, in the image. Primarily, we're trying to only correct lens vignetting. Um, we're, you know, this LCC, when we go ahead and create it using this button, it's going to even out 
delight in our in our image. Um, all we're doing here is correcting for any slight vignetting of the lens. Want to make sure that any area within our field of view is the exact same brightness. Um, this doesn't correct for sort of poor lighting um, arrangement or poor lighting setup. So if you have your one light is too close to your imaging platform than the other, one light is lower than the other, um, one light is maybe on, if it's a power pack, one light is set dimmer than the other. Um, the LCC does not change that. What we've basically done is just placed something that is very, very matte, um, ideally like a, like a gray matte board into the camera's field of view, taken a picture of it in Capture One, um, rendered it as somewhere around middle gray, and then create that LCC profile from it. Um, once we have that image, um, for those of you who use Capture One, you'll know that we can't change the sort of characteristics of an image until um, until we, or the characteristics being applied to an image until we actually have one to work with. So the first thing we do after we have our you know, sort of focus and, and, and target size established is make that LCC. And we want to be certain that we are changing our ICC profile from whatever generic color profile we have to phase one effects and then no color correction. This, this, this is something that you can do no matter what camera you're using, whether it's a phase one camera, Nikon camera, Canon camera, et cetera. But you want to use this no color correction. What this is basically going to do is strip um, any ICC profile from the image, and it's only going to be using that, that RGB data um, that's coming straight from the camera sensor and into Capture One. We don't want to profile a target that's already been profiled with you know, an ICC profile in here. So if you see something like you know, Canon 5D Mark II generic or um, you know, Phase One IQ3100 flash, uh, those are sort of generic profiles. You want to make sure that you strip that away. And then you also want to have this on your linear scientific curve if you're using a Phase One. Um, if you're using any other camera, um, you'll likely see linear response. We want to use the most linear curve that we can here. Um, this basically means that no extra contrast, no sort of creative contrast that you might want in portrait photography or landscape photography um, is being added to the image. We essentially just want a, a very flat, linear reproduction of what the camera is seeing. So be sure that you change these two in Capture One. Okay. Once we have that LCC profile, both the base characteristics and the profile itself will get applied to our image, right? So here's my image of my targets and I included an SG in here um, for something that we'll go over later. Um, but you can see that my LCC profile is being attached to this image, and then I'm also using the no color correction and linear scientific curve. Um, in this image, this is just variant of, of, of variant one. So right here, I have a crop to my target, and again, showing that it's no color correction, and linear scientific with that LCC applied. Um, another thing that I'm going to do is I will disable any sharpening applied to the image. Um, I find that that does cause some little bit of interference um, with the profiling software. So just take all that sharpening off, give you like very nice homogenous um, uh, information across across the patch. If you're over sharpening. If you have excessive amounts of sharpening maybe in the image, you could, you could you know, have some sort of artifacting that could throw off the profiling software. Um, we want the patches to look as smooth as they do in real life, so I turn that sharpening off. Okay, and other things to kind of keep in mind when you're photographing the target, um, you know, you wa also want to be sure that you're using the base ISO of your camera, or at least the lowest possible. 
I have mine set here at ISO 50, that being the lowest possible for the phase one, IXG 100. So now that I have my capture of my target without any color profile applied to it, simply what the camera is seeing, given my specific lighting situation, the, given the lights that I'm using, uh, these specifically were the DT Photon LED light sources, um, I'm going to set my white balance and my exposure on my target. Um, if you're using the NGT, if you know, if you're already a user of this target, the NGT uh, V2, you're going to white balance on patch G6. If you're using the color checker SG to build a color profile, you would be um, white balancing on, let's see, patch F5 right here. Um, and if you're, if you, you know, using some other target to build a color profile, let's say, um, and you're not quite sure that that target has something that is very spectrally neutral, being that the gray patches on this target reflect the visible spectrum, you know, evenly. So it is spectrally neutral. It, we it can confirm that it is gray. And we'll look at how we how we actually know that in a little bit. But if you're, if you're not quite sure, but you do have an ISA target, let's say, this doesn't have enough patches to build a color profile, in my opinion, but it does also have those spectrally neutral patches. So I can go ahead and white balance on patch 13. That would be the one that I would white balance there. We basically just want to neutralize any color cast coming in uh, to the image uh, and neutralize the color cast of our light source. Um, after that, I'll set my exposure. Now, setting exposure um, is is pretty important. Um, we we want to do we want to do this as much in camera as we possibly can. Um, so if you're using a studio strobe pack, you're going to want to adjust the power of your pack to get your exposure to where it needs to be. Um, we don't want to underexpose this image and then push it in software, nor do we want to blow out our image and overexpose it and then pull it back in software. Yes, cameras have an enormous amount of dynamic range, you know, upwards of 15 um, and, and more, you know, especially with these, with the phase one cameras and the, I, even the IQ 4150, you know, even though we have all that dynamic range to work with, we still want the raw data to be as close or basically as properly exposed as possible. Um, so if you're using continuous light source, you're gonna wanna change that shutter speed that you're using you're using strobes, leave everything alone and just adjust the power pack itself to get yourself to the correct exposure. Um, now, what is the right exposure? Um, you know, we have measured this specific target and I know that patch D6, my white patch here, has a CIE lab value of about 94 um, I think it's around 94.5. Let's see, it was over here in SpectraShop. And I use this, this is something, this is a program called SpectraShop. I use it in conjunction with an i1 Pro 2, and it allows me to take spectral measurements of each individual patch on my target to yeah, have all sorts of information available to me. This, uh, the spectral data. XYZ data, lab data, um, RGB data, et cetera. You know, I just want to know that known value of my target because the closer I am to capturing my target at the proper exposure, when I cross-reference that with the actual, you know, the, the reference data in basic color, um, it's going to make my life much, 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 uh, much easier. I'm going to have a much more successful profile. So here's my lab data at about 94.3, um, and here we are at 94.3. Um, you can see that I didn't do 
any adjustment in my exposure slider. I didn't change this at all. Um, so that's great. I was able, given, given the power of my lights, the distance of my camera from the target, it just so worked out that it was um, near zero. Um, if, you, if you are you know, just a touch off, um, that's okay. The profiling software will, will, will adjust the brightness for you. Um, so once you have your exposure set, um, then we can go ahead and export this image. Um, and from here, what I'm gonna do is go to my process recipes tab. Um, process recipes, of course, are just a number of different parameters by which we can um, process out a derivative. Specifically for profiling a camera, I want to use um, this specific option. Um, when you're, you, we're going to create a 16-bit TIFF uh, to feed into Basic Color or any of our other color profiling softwares, of course. Uh, you know, I am talking about basic color here, um, but the, the core concepts sort of do apply um, to the general workflow to create a custom profile, um, an in-situ profile, I should say. Um, so I made myself this process recipe called camera profiling. It's a TIFF. It is in 16 bits. And for my color profile, Different than if I was going to export, let's say, a 16-bit TIFF um, as like a preservation uh, master file, um, where this might go to um, you know an archival color space like Adobe RGB 1998. For profiling, again, because I don't want to profile an image that's already been quote unquote profiled by exporting this to Adobe RGB or Profoto, et cetera. I want to embed the camera profile. This is essentially going to pull this, no color correction, um, in, in a way. It's not going to actually assign it with anything. Um, we're just going to get our specific RGB data or our lab data um, from, from the image. Um, one thing I, I am noticing in Capture One 20, this is something just, just to mention, it's just, or at least my, my version, is it's not showing me my lab values when I'm proofing here um, on my embedded camera profile. So if you just want to double check that, that brightness um, before you export it, just go ahead and, and highlight one of your profiles that are proofing um, in you know, Adobe RGB or maybe um, um, ECI RGB, or et cetera, uh, just to get those lab values to, to populate if, if yours is, is sort of acting this way like mine is right now. Um, but essentially, we're just going to export this as is. I like to crop it um, because why? Why export an enormous image? I just want the target image, and you know, go ahead and hit the process button and and shoot that out. So, what do we do with that now? Okay, so we're going to feed it into Basic Color Input Six Pro. Uh, specifically, this is the Pro Edition again. I'm using basic color input six. Um, you could be using a different version of basic color. You could be using a different profiling software um, completely. But again, the core concepts are, are the main thing I want to take away uh, from, from all this. Um, but specifically, there are some, some very interesting things that, that um, basic color does, does do um, and, and helps with for reproduction, um, cultural heritage reproduction profiles. So basic color input six has all sorts of color target profiles. Um, I, sh I shouldn't use the word profile. Uh, they refer to them as jobs or presets. Um, you can basically export to a, a, a very, very wide uh, number of, of profiles here. Um, there's IT8 targets, there's color checker SG targets, there's um, color checker classics. Um, in basic color input six right now, um, what you'll what you'll see if you're using um, the DTNGT v2, um, it's actually a preset called 
Library of Congress. Um, and that's just simply because it's it's sort of left over from from when this when this um, target was created for the Library of Congress. We've you know it's since been updated, um, but the, the the sort of layout is still the same. So you're just going to go on to find your um, find your target. It's in alphabetical order. So here again, Library of Congress NGT. If I want to edit that, I click on um, the little pencil icon. And from here, what I'm going to do is update this to use my specific measurements for my target. Um, if you don't have specific measurements, um, you'll see that there's going to be already populated those nominal values for your target. You can see right here the color checker digital SG. It already has some pre-populated information in there. Same with the X rights. They, everything ha has a sort of um, nominal value, but I want to use the specific values for my target so I can get the most precise profile that I can. Select that, and then you can go ahead and update that and um, go find it on your computer and. Um, you can, let's see, Spectra Shop, and you can upload that. So I had this. So here's my information. This is kind of what it looks like. It's just, a, a, I do it in the CGATS 17 format for basic color. Um, that's what it looks for. Um, and it's looking for um, row by row. So A, B, C, zero. Um, a, B, C, 1, A, B, C, 2, et cetera. Um, quick little note that no matter what, what target you do use, if you are using basic color, I find that it wants the quotations that get exported here around the A0, B0, C0, et cetera. It wants those taken out. So just go ahead and delete those before you upload it. Once it's uploaded, um, you can go ahead and click on expert mode and in expert mode this is where we're going to select okay what kind of ICC profile um, are we making um, there's a few different options here up in the top um, you can create color profiles in basic color from two different illuminants you can make a generic color profile this would be more for you know product photography landscape photography like something that has a little bit more of a uh, a contrast curve may be built in. If you want a specific reproduction profile, you want to use this Repro D50 option um, because all of the all the values that we're using are exported in, in this and sort of transformed around um, the D50 illuminant. And we're going to select Capture One profiles. Um, there are some for for digital camera profiles for working with um, Adobe Camera Raw. The difference between this is there's just like a, a color temperature slider that you can adjust in ACR. For Capture One, um, the interface is just different. The program is different. Um, the calculations are all the same. It's just how do we want this profile to interface with our raw processing software. Um, I'm going to go ahead and select an Art Repro, an archival profile type. I can optimize it around Delta E2000. This is just going to tell me, you know, in my report later on, what is my Delta E2000 values? We can get Delta E76, Delta E94. These can also get changed later, and we'll see that in a second. But it's just asking you what, what information um, do you want populated right from the get-go? What's the sort of default view? Um, quality control, this is... This is something that basically is going to automatically populate your profile optimization based on um, any number of, of standards or guidelines that exist out there for digitization. So if I were to select um, you know, ISO 19264, um, or if I want to select FAGI, um, it goes ahead and puts me in the Delta E2000L. Um, again, it's just a default view. We can change that later on in our, in our actual profile build. 
Um, one of the very interesting things about Basic Color Input 6 Pro, specifically in Pro, um, we have the ability to edit the grayscale ramp and the color, the, the most saturated colors on our target um, after the profile is generated. So if you see something that is a little bit of out of whack, um, we have the opportunity to actually change that in the color profile itself, um, which can definitely, definitely come in handy. Um, so the other thing we can do in, in the 6 Pro version is we can do shading. So if you're using a, pro, a program that does not have something like, um, you know, shading or, you know, uh, 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 LCCs or whatever you want to call it built in to your processor, we can do illuminance uniformity. We can do even fielding on our target um, in basic color input six pro. Um, I leave it off because I've already taken care of my even fielding by setting up my lights at my 45 degree angles, equidistant from, from the imaging surface. And I've created that LCC profile that creates even illumination uniformity. Um, and then you can go ahead and save the preset. Um, over here in ICC profiles, this is just, it's again, they're very, very similar. Um, Capture One profiles, this is also the one thing that's different from here. You can see the interface is identical. This is just going to smart name your color profile um, upon creation so that it has the correct naming structure so that it populates in this list for your camera right away in Capture One. Um, I've already gone ahead and done that. You would you would save the preset and name it. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and you know go to go to the cake that's already made in the oven. And select my DT next generation target V2. So I'll go to profiling, right? So this is great, this is nice and easy. I can just go ahead and drag and drop um, my image right onto the interface. So here's my, here's my folder. I export the image of the NGT to a, a, a folder called no color correction just so I can kind of keep things uh, organized and I just drag and drop it. You'll see that it's gonna place a grid over the target. Um, if you have, it should sort of auto detect this, but if, if, you, if it is a little bit off, you can grab these corners and you can you know, drag it around and, and basically match this up. Um, we're looking for, um, you, know, the, you should see the background, which is your actual target, target itself. And on top of that, the little, um, uh, triangle, let's call it, that that little earmark is the, the reference data. So this is the, let's see, like this is the, yeah, the blue that my target is rendering as with no color profile attached to it. Um, up here is my reference data. So we can get a good sense of, okay, if these look generally pretty close, um, there might be a little bit of a difference in, in brightness uh, or, or darkness. We want to be very, very, very close. If they're, if they're too different, that probably means that um, you have the wrong reference data maybe or the, cut, the target, you forgot to white balance to it or um, the exposure is off, any one of those things. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and name this file dt and dt v2. This is just my sample. Because I've already made one sample two. Already made one. And we're just gonna go ahead and create the profile. It's gonna crunch the numbers. Again, any any color profiling software we have we use is gonna do the same thing. Place a grid over the target, hit profile, and have it crunch the numbers. But what's unique to input six um, is it, just the interface and, and some of these other um, color and grayscale edits um, that are really quite helpful. 
uh, up at the top here, again, it's defaulting me to Delta E2000. And if, you know, if I wanted to change this specifically to um, follow maybe a FAGI or ISO standard, I can do that here. With the slider, as I increase or decrease this, this is telling me what percentage of my patches have a Delta E2000 value of 0.5 or less. So 50% of the patches have a Delta E from the profile, um, from, the, from the target measurements to the actual profile I just built. Half of the targets here have a Delta E of 0.5 or less. If I drag it up to 75% have a Delta E of 0.7 or less. And you can see my maximum is 1.5 nine here at the top. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. And we can see where those come in. Um, it has a sort of a, a, a larger um, border around that green square um, if when, it, when it's that max delta E value. Um, let's see. If we go to our grayscale edit, this is where I could go ahead and click on one of these patches and if these are if these are wildly off for some reason, again, if you're if your lighting is set up well, if you are imaging the target at forty five degrees, if you are using um, you know if you made that LCC profile, if you're using the um, the specific target values for your for your target to create the profile you're likely gonna have very good results. Um, for my purposes, you know, we, we could go, go in here and we could fuss with all of these and we could um, change the L, let's say for my uh, black patch, I could increase the L value here. You know, my profile is 9.9, .9, but the reference was 10.1. Uh, if I wanted to increase that, I could. If I wanted to change my, uh, you know, my whitest patch here um, to get the delta E of 0.3 down to absolutely zero, I could do that. For 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 now, you know, I'm a firm believer in not changing anything until we see exactly what what the profile does to the image. So we can always revisit this and reprofile and edit these later. But it's it's worth noting that we can edit the grayscale ramp in, um, you know, for the color checker SG, we can do it in a 12 step grayscale ramp for the, um, for this target for the NGTV2, there's 14 grayscales available. So a little bit um, wider range of grays to choose from and, and profile off of. The same thing goes for your most saturated colors. So if any of these look off, um, you know, point one, I, I would say a delta E of one, or, or more, I would definitely go in here and change. But for now, all of these are delta E's of like 0.5 or less. I'm, I'm just gonna leave it and see how things look and, and then I'll readdress later on. If you wanna report from basic color, um, it will give you that. And this is what that looks like. So it'll give you information about the camera model that you used, um, you know, very, very basic exit data, um, as well as the overall um, information, your average delta E, the peak delta E, um, uniformity um, on that target. So, you know, we had less than 1% um, um, uniformity difference between each of those white patches around the edge. So that's great. That's, you know, again, thinking about FAGI, that's within FAGI guidelines. Very happy with how that's looking. Um, if your uniformity was too high, great indicator that, yeah, your lights should maybe be reassessed or maybe you should check your ICC profile. All right. So I can't just take that information and say, okay, awesome. Um, my color profile is 100% validated um, because basic color said that my, uh, you know, half my delta E values were 
0.5 or less, and my, my max delta E was 1.9. We have to take that color profile, and we have to assign it to another target um, to check or validate the, the, the sort of quality of the, the formation of our new color profile. So here's a color checker SG that I have with my DT NGT V2 target um, profile applied. And we could do one of two things. If you have, um, well, first, let's just show this. A great sniff test would be to use um, these nominal overlays um, that, that we at DT have made up. Um, we have them for the color checker SG. We have them for the uh, ISA object level target. Um, and we have them in a variety of color spaces, Adobe RGB, ECI, um, RGB, um, Profoto, and I believe sRGB is the other one. Or maybe it was, I think it was actually lab data. Regardless, um, you can download those from our website, dtculturalheritage.com. And I'm just going to drag this image into my overlay tool. And what this is, is this is the, the nominal values um, of, of the color checker SG. So it's not going to be perfect, perfect for mine, but it's going to be pretty darn close. Um, and we can change the scale on this. Um, you can see there's the, the circles in the corners that'll help you identify those fiducial marks. Um, you know, I'm in the process of making one for the NGTV2. Um, but this is basically going to show us as a quick sniff test, hey, how, how close am I to my, to my color? And how, how is the tone scale looking? Right now, I'm noticing that I'm very, very happy with how the tone scale is looking. Um, and I'm also very happy with how a lot of these near neutrals are looking. Again, uh, thinking about what Dave talked about, um, the NGTV2 sampled a very large range of, of paper-based um, cultural heritage materials. So it's no surprise that we're going to have, you know, pretty, pretty good looking neutrals. And uh, these are the skin tone patches on the SG, but they, they are, you know, in a similar range. Um, if anybody wants to take a look at the ISA target with my DT NGT V2 applied. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, drag that in. I can go ahead and get those on there. This has to be just a touch bigger. So you know, again, these are nominal values. Um, you could download this and certainly drop in your own patch values. If you know your lab data for your specific target, you could certainly drop those in. But again, it's a, it's a sniff test. I mean, if we look at patch 10, I know for a fact that this target has been a little bit mishandled um, over the years. Um, so this white patch is a bit darker. Um, uh, I can't be completely certain that my red isn't totally out of whack or if it's looking good. I actually know that it is looking good here, um, but it's just my red is different than the nominal value red. The reason I know that is because if I, if I want to sort of go a step further from the, the sniff test, I could run any of my targets through Golden Thread software. So in Golden Thread, I took my image of that color checker SG with my NGT V2 profile attached to it. And I'm going to look at the color values. And we're looking actually pretty, pretty good, actually quite good. And I'm very happy with this. Um, if you recall the sort of mean delta E from, from before on my target, my NGTV2 target from the profile, the profile versus the measurements, the average delta E was somewhere around 0.6. My, 
my average delta E on the SG is uh, 1.24. And for the delta E AB, my color, um, it's actually less than one, it's 0.8. Um, I am very, very, very happy with how this is looking. Um, I have my, my maximum and, and upper limit set to follow FAGI four guidelines. So an, a maximum value of six and an average value of three. I am well, well, well within those ranges. Um, and I'm very happy with how this is looking. I will say that the, the peaks that we do see around the corners here, um, from the test image that I had, uh, every one of these, uh, what is this, D, G, J, N, um, some of these with the higher values, those are my whites and blacks. And if you'll notice in this image, it's not quite positioned ideally. Let's say it is. A, it is a bit larger in the image in the in the imaging area. Um, the the digital SG is paper. It does have a paper backing rather than aluminum backing, so it does have the tendency to bow and not lay perfectly flat. And those patches are going to be much more susceptible to metamerism. Um, and they may appear to be brighter or darker in the image than they actually are because the target is bowing a little bit and it's reflecting light um, in a non-linear way um, as opposed to the very, very, very flat patches on the NGT-82. So I'm going to, you know, Given what I have here on my computer, I'm going to take this with a grain of salt uh, for these black and white patches around the perimeter and really focus my attention here in the middle where my color and, and, and sort of neutrals are, and it's looking really good. Um, one other thing we can look at then is my golden thread report for the object level target. Um, this is my NGT V2 profile attached, and um, we have very similar results. My average delta E being 1.5, the max is hovering around three, and the average being around 0.8. Um, these are very, very similar, which is basically telling me that, I think we, you know, we did a very good job forming this profile, um, numerically speaking. The last thing that I might do is, and what you should do is, Go ahead and apply your profile to an image. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna swap back and forth. And if you can't see this extremely well, that's okay. Um, it is in the PDF of uh, screen grabs that I that I that we have uh, circulating around. If I swap between this profile here, which is sort of like a generic profile, versus this profile here, which is my DT NGT V2 profile, let me take the crop off of this so it doesn't jump around on us. We have the generic and the in situ profile I just made with the NGT. Generic, and we have the NGT V2. The major, major difference I see is there's a kind of a nasty red cast that was in this image that starts to go away. And some of that, some of that yellow uh, from the paper really starts to come through in a much more uh, in a much more true way. And I know that saying that is a bit subjective because nobody here other than me uh, and the DT team has access to seeing this specific thing. Um, but if you had that object in front of you, and I can tell you right now, having worked with this book for years and years now, um, this is not what the paper base looks like. It is definitely not that red. It is nice, a little bit less red. A little bit more yellow in there, and we can see numerically that um, you know our our A, this what, five point three, five point zero, four point six, 
there is more red here, less red here, um, and a bit more a bit more true to, to how that paper looks. And no surprise that that's going to be in, in large part due to um, that, that set of sampled cultural heritage colors that are on the NGTV2. Um, OK, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing because that's I have, all that I have. Um, that's all that I have for 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 the workflow option. Um, um, Dave, I, I don't know if you have anything uh, short to add before we get into questions. I actually signed up for this before I was signed up to be a presenter, so I was uh, I learned a lot of that stuff too. So I'm. Uh, I'm good. There's a lot of, I don't know, you probably haven't been watching, but there's a whole lot of stuff going on over in the chat and questions and things for us to get to, so. Cool. Um, okay, so be uh, before we get to it, um, I, I do want to say that uh, for everybody here um, who attended the webinar today, uh, we are offering a 10% discount on the DT NGT V2, as well as Basic Color Input 6 Pro. Um, so, so that's going to be extended to, to all the participants today as a thank you, you know, for, for being out here and, and just, you know, joining us in, in, you know, not just Project Lemonade, but just learning and, and sort of like just figuring, figuring things out and learning more. So um, we want to extend that as well as the first 10 people who purchase Basic Color Input 6 Pro are going to, um, are going to receive Basic Color display six for free. So um, so the first 10 people, we're going to give basic color display six for free. Um, there is no pro version of display. It is what it is, but it, like it sounds, it is a color profiling, um, a monitor or display profiling software from basic color. Um, for anybody who's used five or earlier, uh, six is a, a much needed and, and, and much appreciated refresher. Uh, it, it's almost a completely different program in, in a way. It looks awesome. Um, so we're, we're going to send out uh, in, in for more information about it um, in the follow-up email. So, so more specifics about the software um, for anybody who, who are curious. So yeah, so we're going to go ahead and um, Go ahead and let's, let's uh, take some questions. This is Arnab here. Um, I've been moderating the questions. And so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to hit this button here. And it'll pop up the question on the screen. And if you guys want to go ahead and answer that, I can just kind of uh, take them up and down and uh, let you guys focus on that, if that works. Yeah, that's OK, great. great. So our first question is up there. OK, from Gregory, we have, uh, can you use other profiling software other than basic help? Uh, the answer is yes. Of course, you can use other profiling software um, other than basic color. Um, there, there's a slew of, of software out there, some, uh, some paid software, some completely open source, and command line driven even. Um, the, again, concepts apply uh, to that in-situ profile creation, um, but any profiling software will do. Um, we just happen to prefer basic color. Uh, we're we're a big fan. Uh, I'm you know specifically a big fan of the engine that it uses. So I have to click that. Okay. Okay. Um, next question. Um, this one is, is answered, but uh, it's from Jarrell. Uh, so I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that. Um, is this DT target with the circular patches something that's been sold or provided with newer systems? I haven't seen this target before. Okay, good question. Um, so the DT, okay, so this target, the NGTV2 target, um, is not something that is included with the system, um, but it is, it, you know, it's a peripheral and it'll work with any, any imaging system. Um, so it's something that you could purchase on the website. Okay, um, let's see. Are we going to move on to 
the object level target question? They don't seem to be coming through, but um, next question, you can just read them out. Yeah, so do you have an object level target? Um, we don't, but Image Science Associates does. Um, they'll be the, the creators of the object level target. Um, of course, the one that I had showed earlier that has all of the other information on there just, uh, you know, besides color and tone, uh, it's less of a camera calibration target as it is, um, you know, um, a device or object um, uh, level target. I'm just realizing a red object was thinking device. Um, we don't have an object level target. Um, that would, again, be something ISA would, would, would be used for. Um, but including that object level along with the, um, the DT and GTV2 could give you good, good, good information about um, you know, scale or, or SFR. Um, the NGTV2 has color and tone pretty, um, pretty well taken care of. Okay, so can we use the same approach for in-field, in-studio work? Um, yes. Yes, uh, definitely. Um, the same approach applies. Um, you're just going to want to use your specific lighting setup. So, you know, I talked very uh, specifically about reproduction profiles for cultural heritage materials or for art reproduction. Um, in field, in studio, if you have something like a color checker SG or Passport or even the NGTV2 for that matter, um, if you have that and place it in the scene, you can then go back in and create a profile from that. Um, that's a little bit um, outside of my expertise as far as dealing with how, how the targets are reflecting colors, um, you know, with a bit different uh, illumination geometry, but the same concept does apply, yeah. Uh, same thing, get that color profile taken off the image, export it out as a TIFF with no color profile attached, and then work through the same process. Specifically in basic color, um, you, you saw that there was the C1 color option, um, things of that nature. So just make sure you pick a profile that's not for reproduction specifically, and you'll be fine. Okay, great. Um, how critical is the light source angle? Um, Dave, do you want to maybe speak about that? As far as color, color rendering and, and illuminating the, the, the target. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think we want to do the best we can with it, but the reality is, uh, I mean, there's a couple things. Either we may have mechanical reasons, we can't sit right at 45 degrees. And the other thing is that the natural, uh, output of any of the lights you're going to use in a photographic situation aren't really collimated to a single angle anyway. So um, so I don't think we're going to see huge issues by this. Um, and I think there are some um, some photographers that I know would choose greater than 45 degrees. So, you know, more closer to raking, but not raking um, and still get uh, good results from that. So I'm not sure I have enough data to answer the question really definitively, but I don't think you're going to have a problem with any of the configurations that you would have already gotten good photographic results from. Yeah, I'll kind of jump in, I jump onto that and say uh, the target reference images that I used, they were probably imaged somewhere around between maybe 35 and four, probably closer to 40 degrees um, in our studio. I think a lot of people um, I think a lot of people might might agree in that 45 degrees, well, well, is you know sort of the ideal, is not always the most practical too, and and so if you are a little bit lower, um, you know maybe 40 degrees to kind of mitigate some of reflections you might get, let's say in glass or highly very large, highly glossy or reflective objects, you know you're not going to get terrible results by kind of bringing the lights down just a little bit. Um, and again, that that they're not so collimated, like like Dave mentioned. You know, most studio lights, whether LED or, or strobes, they're they're going to be pretty diffuse anyway. So, okay. Um, can you add a focus and PPI checker? That's that's a great question. Um, 
I think, uh, I mean, I won't speak for Dave, but as far as, as far as I look at the target, the NGT V2 is primarily, it is, it is designed to be a camera characterization target. Um, you know, we leave the, the, the resolution, um, the resolution checking, um, slash focus checking to, to, you know, what's being printed on the ISA, but not to say it's outside the realm of possibility, but um, Dave, I don't know if you want to yeah, speak to that. With that. I mean, the, the original design was a color metric target for the Library of Congress, and they had other tools like the ISA uh, suite of tools um, for their, uh, for the, the other uh, camera focus and those, those sort of things, spatial, spatial tools. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Why not fill the frame with the target? Um, Gregory asks. Um, so I, I basically, I choose not to fill the entire frame with the target because it's going to decrease our chance for geometric metamerism, um, being that if we're maybe using, let's put it this way, most most lenses that are used, if you have, unless you're photographing maybe at very, very high magnifications, if you use a sort of normal length lens or even a, a mid to long lens, if you get right up on that target and you're filling the frame, um, you're gonna, the, the geometry between the camera, the target, and then your lights, becomes more extreme, that angle becomes more extreme the closer you get. Um, so by pulling the camera back and including the target in a smaller area of the image, you're not getting any worse data, but you are, um, um, or, or you're not getting any less data, I should say, but you are getting better geometry between the camera, the target, and the lights to get that sort of 45-ish degree angle of illumination. Um, if you're using, let's say, an infinitely long lens and you stand, you know, a thousand feet back um, and you can image the entire target and it fills the whole frame of your camera, then that's certainly, there's no reason you shouldn't feel, fill the frame. But a general rule of thumb is if you're using like a 50 millimeter for small format or 72, 80 millimeters for, for medium format, um, you know, put it in that center, center ninth uh, of the image and, and you'll be good. Okay. What are the gray edit and color edit options in the new basic color? Um, so I think I did mention that, um, but just to reiterate, the gray edit and color edit options are going to allow us to edit the ICC profile within the color profiling software. Um, it, it means that we don't have to take the, the profile to an external color editing or ICC profile editing software to tweak the profile, we can actually change the math in basic color to adjust the lab values of the grayscale ramp or the color values of the 12 most saturated colors on the target to get better results. All right, Dave, I will let you, Mill, let's see. Because the target is metal, how would you suggest handling in combination with profiling under glass? Um, great question. I, I, I think you could do a, a ton of different things. Maybe build up a small perimeter of mat board around the target so that it's just barely not touching the glass surface um, and that the mat board's actually touching the glass and not the target. Um, that, that's certainly a possibility. Maybe put a little bit of felt around the perimeter of the target maybe um, just to prevent it from touching the glass. Yeah, yeah, I don't know, Dave, you don't have anything to add to that, do you? I was just to say that the, um, the top surface of the patches varies just a tiny bit, depending on the thickness of the particular layer of paint underneath there. Um, but they should be very close to flush with the top surface of the aluminum, you know, within 
I don't know, at most a thousandth of an inch or something like that. So you could put, um, like what Spencer just said, a very thin layer of felt around the outside or something. Um, and it's going to be stiff enough to stay, you know, you just need, or even just, I think uh, Doug might have commented in here, like little thin rubber rubber bumpers on the corners or something like that. I think anything to, to, to just, uh, you probably don't want to indirect contact with the glass. But not so far away that the light is like kind of reflecting and bouncing around right. in there. You know, you want it to be real thin. Okay, great. Um, let's see, let's finish answering that question. Great. Um, okay, Paul asks, are there any considerations when using polarizing filters? Um, yes. Yeah, definitely. Um, you should certainly re well if you have a profile that's been built without polarizing and then you do polarize your light source you should certainly build a new profile um dave correct me if i'm wrong you should also measure that target with a device that can simulate the polarization as well correct um, yeah, definitely re-measure and re-profile re uh, uh, under that uh, that situation. Um, so yeah, and and the the, the various um, you know we're not selling instruments here, but the various instrument manufacturers usually provide a facility for that. I'm just going to chime in. We are uh, over time. Uh, so I, I am going to have to ask that we end the questions here on, on the webinar. But if you do have additional questions and you want to send them to us at info at dtdch.com, uh, we'll make sure that those get to the right person and we get those answered for you. Um, don't forget that we have the handouts that have the presentation that you can download, um, as well as a replay link that will be sent out for uh, everybody that attended. Um, and we will also have a survey going out as well, and we'd appreciate your feedback. So um, any, uh, I'll, I'll let Dave and Spencer take back over if you want to have any closing remarks. No, I'm good. Thanks for everyone for coming. This is a fantastic response. Um, love to see all the interest out there, and um, I would just hope to see some cool questions that uh, that can help with. Yeah, likewise. Uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And uh, we're pretty easy to find if you have questions. So yep. just, just give us a holler. Take All care. Right. Take care, everyone.